about the fourth of the rightly guided Khulafa, Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. And Ali radiallahu anhu was from the Quraysh and he was from Bani Hashim. And he was, his name was Ali, the son of Abi Talib. And Abi Talib, as you can see, when you see Abu something, it's most of the time a patronymic, a kunya. And they usually have another name. So he was Ali, the son of Abu Talib, whose name was Abdul Manaf, the son of Abdul Muttalib. And he was, of course, the, the cousin of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he had a kunya as well, his patronymic, they would call him Abu Al-Hasan, because obviously his son was Al-Hasan, so he is the father of Al-Hasan, Abu Al-Hasan. And he was also referred to as Abu Turab, because one time he was lying down in the masjid, and the Prophet, and the, 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 the sand, because there was sand in the masjid, and the sand was, had covered part of him. So the Prophet tells him, tells him, قُمْ يَا أَبَا تُرَاب Get up, O Abu Turab, meaning the one covered with dust. And they used to love the Prophet ﷺ so much that if he ever gave someone a nickname, it would stick. And so they would also refer to him as Abu Turab. His mother was Fatima bint al-Asad ibn Hashim. And Ali radiallahu anhu had this great honor of being raised in the household of the Prophet ﷺ. So you might wonder, you know, he's the son of Abu Talib and everyone knows that was the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ. But what brought him to be raised in the house of the Prophet ﷺ? And Abu Talib had many children and he couldn't afford uh, to provide for all of them. So Ali ibn Abi Talib was given to the Prophet ﷺ. So uh, the Prophet ﷺ and Hamza took some of the children to raise them in their homes. And Ali radiallahu anhu had the great honor and pleasure of being raised in the household of the Prophet ﷺ. And as we all know, he is of the ten given glad tidings of paradise. And when you ask people who are the ten given glad tidings of paradise, they all know Ali is in there because everybody says Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, and the other six, right? Who were who were Talha, Nuzubair, and Saad, and Abdurrahman ibn Auf, and Abu Ubaida, Amir ibn Jarrah, and Saeed ibn Zaid. Saeed ibn Zaid, the man who made the first adhan, right? Or who saw the Adhan in the Ru'ya more accurately. طيب, so Ali radiallahu anhu, he was the first male to accept Islam. Because he was a young boy. So sometimes you'll hear scholars say, Ali was the first male to accept Islam. And then you'll hear, you'll also read that Abu Bakr was the first man to become Muslim. And there isn't really much contradiction there. What they mean is that the first male was Ali. The first, but he was a young boy. So when you count the men, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu would be the first man to become Muslim. If you ever re- run into that and find the confusion. And he never prostrated to idols in his life. He never made sujood to any idol. Because of that, you find some people will say, Karram Allahu wajha. But actually, that's not correct. Yani you shouldn't, which means may Allah honor his face. So always they say, Ali Karram Allahu wajha. Ali Karram Allahu wajha. But it's not really accurate to say that and uh, because uh, there were also many other companions that never made sujood to idols. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was one of them. Uthman was amongst them. There were other Hunafa. They didn't make sujood to idols. So why single out Ali radiallahu anhu with this phrase? And that's why the scholars say you don't say karamallahu wajah. You just say radiallahu anhu like you do to all uh, the rest of the companions. Now he was also amongst the scholars. So he was a scholar and he was one of the, the courageous heroes of Islam. And he also was very ascetic and he left the, the materialism of this dunya. And he was known for his piety and he was a very, very powerful and uh, eloquent orator, excellent in speech. And he was a warrior like none other. And he witnessed all the battles with the Prophet ﷺ, except for the battle of Tabuk. But even in the Battle of Tabuk, the Prophet ﷺ gave him another honor. The Prophet ﷺ left him in charge of the city of Medina while he went away to the Battle of Tabuk. And he told him, Are you not pleased to be to me as Harun was to Musa salam?" Because Musa, when he left, he left Harun in charge in his place. So he's telling the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet ﷺ is telling Ali radiallahu anhu, Aren't you happy to have the same position that Harun had with Musa? But... The Prophet ﷺ didn't leave it there. Because if he left it there, you will have people who say, you see, Ali should be the next Prophet. Or they will exaggerate. And so the Prophet ﷺ, his speech is always accurate. 
He added, except that there is no Prophet coming after me. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And another honor that he had, he was also left behind in Medina when the Prophet ﷺ made Hijr. He left Ali radiallahu anhu in charge of uh, يعني, returning people's amanat, the possessions, and the things that were entrusted with the Prophet. ﷺ. He left Ali radiallahu anhu to return that to their rightful owners. His description was that he was a short, muscular man. Because now everyone always has a, a, an image, right? You always have an image of what Abu Bakr looks like and what Umar looks like. And most of the time when you read it, you. It's really total the, op- the opposite of what you imagined. So Ali radiallahu anhu was a short man. And he was very muscular. They described that between his shoulders were muscles like that of a lion. Very strong man. And as he g- became older, he actually became heavy. So maybe you might have imagined him as a thin old man. He actually became heavy. And he was very bald. The description says he was very bald and he had much hair. What does that mean? Very bald up here. And had much hair in his arms and his body, but he was bald uh, in the head. And he had a huge white beard. They described that it filled that was which betw- that that was between his shoulders and his chest. So, huge, thick, full beard. And later on, of course, he also had a large stomach. So, even though he was muscular and everything, he had a large stomach, and that's possible. You've seen that, right? Talk to your father when you get home. Uh, and of course, very courageous, courageous, courageous warrior. Uh, he, one of the first things he did, he slept in the bed of the Prophet ﷺ when they were trying to assassinate him. So the Quraysh sent you know, young men from each tribe and they're all going to with one blow strike the Prophet ﷺ and kill him. And they were waiting outside his house. The Prophet ﷺ actually يعني, sneaked away and Ali radiallahu anhu was in his place. Sleeping in his place. But he also said that that was one of the best nights he ever had in sleep. Which really shows he was a very courageous man. Because and you're sleeping in the place of someone that, wants, that the people want to assassinate. And how would you sleep that night? And you forget the word sleep, right? You, you hear an ant. You, you just be looking around all night. But he slept. Very courageous man. And many times the Prophet ﷺ would actually give him the standard in battle. In the standard now, you have to be really a tough warrior to get the standard because uh, the standard is going to, the, the standard bearer is going to be sought after. Everyone's going to try to attack the standard bearer because if the standard falls you and it doesn't rise again, you lose the battle. So the goal of both armies is to try to attack the standard bearer. So you give the standard always to a tough, tough warrior. So many times he would be given the standard, like the Battle of Badr, for example. In the Battle of Khaybar also he was given the standard. And the Prophet ﷺ, before giving the standard, he said that I'm going to give the standard. He said, لا, لَأُعْطِيَنَّ الرَّايَةَ غَدًا رَجُلًا يُحِبُّ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ وَيُحِبُّهُ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولَهُ That I'm going to give the raya, the standard tomorrow, to a man who loves Allah and His Messenger. Now that's of the easier ones. Because everyone says, yeah, I love Allah, I love the Prophet ﷺ. But the second part was that and he is loved by Allah and His Messenger. So everybody wanted to be the person who will receive the standard. And you know the Sahaba, they used to hate leadership positions. They used to hate positions of, of power and to be in charge. They would never seek after it as the Prophet ﷺ taught them to not seek after places of power. But Umar radiallahu anhu says, فَمَا, فما تشوفت للإمارة قبل يوم إذن فما تشوفت للإمارة قبل يوم إذن He said, I had never ever like desired or wanted to be in a leadership position before that day. Because this is someone, whoever will be given the standard, someone loved by Allah and the Prophet ﷺ. Everybody wanted that honor. And then the Prophet ﷺ comes and he gives it to Ali radiallahu anhu. From his excellence in battle as well is that he destroyed Al-Walid ibn Utbah in the duels before the battle of Badr. And in the battle of Safin, they described that at one point he grabbed uh, you know, his opponent. He put one hand in and grabbed him from underneath his armor and lifted him in the air and brought him crashing down and bro- breaking his neck. Very, very powerful man. And one of the, his amazing feats as well in battle... And, and for, the, for the next part, and it'll be rated uh, R for violence, yani, for the youth in the audience. But uh, from his excellence in battle is that he destroyed a legendary, legendary warrior by the name of Amr ibn Abdul Wud. 
This man was a legendary warrior. If he just said his name, that was it. If he said, I'm Amr ibn Abdul, nobody wanted to go out to fight him. Nobody challenged him at all. That was it. But on the day of Al-Khandaq, the battle of the trench, as you know, the Muslims have, had dug a trench in one of the entrances to Medina. And there was a part that was a little bit narrow, and Amr ibn Abdul, with, with a good horse, was able to jump and make it to the other side where the Muslims were. So he asked, Man yubariz, who wants to duel? Who wants to fight? And no one came out to him because he's Amr ibn Abdul. Nobody goes out to him. And there were fantastic warriors in the army, in the Muslim army, but none of them went out to him. So then the Prophet asked, Who will go out to him? And Ali radiallahu anhu got up. He wants to go out and fight this legendary warrior. Ali radiallahu anhu was a young man at the time. So the Prophet tells him no. So then again the Prophet asks, Who will go out to him? And Ali radiallahu anhu gets up. The Prophet tells him no. And again he asks, and Ali gets up. And he tells him, the Prophet tells him, I'm afraid that he might kill you. And Ali radiallahu anhu says, Rather, I will kill him, insha'Allah. The Prophet tells him, Innahu Amrun ya Ali. This is Amr. You know who this is, a legendary warrior. And Ali radiallahu anhu says, What in kan? Even if it is. And he goes out to meet him. And they describe the, the duel, this fierce battle that they had, that they would they started fighting and they were extremely fast, both of them. They would fight and they started to, to go in circles as they're swinging and clashing swords and start to go in circles and kicking up dust. So there, there was so much dust that they couldn't see what's happening. The Muslims just didn't know what was going on. They just saw dust and they could hear swords smashing in the middle of that dust ball. And then suddenly from the middle of the dust they heard, Allahu Akbar! And Ali radiallahu came out and he killed the legendary Amr ibn Abdul. So that was one of the examples of the power of Ali radiallahu anhu in battle. Also in the battle of Safin, that he would go out and fight and he actually had two bodyguards to stop him from going to battle. But at some point, whenever they're not paying attention, he would sneak out and go to uh, and fight and he would only come back when his sword bends. You know what that means, his sword bends? His swords were thick, yani. I give you a sword now and tell you, okay, go hit this metal pole until it bends. And one, two, he'd be like, okay, khalas, it's too much work, it's hard. So, and he would say, if the sword didn't bend, Allah wouldn't come back. Powerful. He also used to say that, مَا قَتَلْتُ رَجُلًا إِلَّا قَتَلْتَهُ I've never fought against anyone except that I killed the person. And then he described, explained one of his secrets of success. He says, لَأَنَّنِي يُعِينُنِي عَلَيْهِ Nafsu, that he says, I am. He, what another thing that helps me, that supports me, in, or gives me assistance, is the fact that he helps me against himself. Why? Because he's afraid. He knows he's fighting against Ali radiallahu anhu. So he already comes in expecting to lose. That's what he was saying. But we said he was an, an excellent orator. He was extremely, uh, extremely eloquent. And one of the things to mention now is there's a book that is kind of attributed to him, a book by the name of Nahjul Balagha. In English, it's the peak of eloquence. But the, the correct opinion, and the scholars explain that it's actually, um, parts of the book can be attributed to Ali radiallahu anhu, but it doesn't come with Isna, the chain of narration. And for the most part, uh, there are a lot of lies in the book and things that Ali radiallahu anhu would never say, some nasty things, some insults to the Sahaba. So the book, Peak of Eloquence, you'll find it in Muslim bookstores and so on. It's not, uh, and it's not by Ali radiallahu anhu. As we said, he's one of the rightly guided Khulafa. And the thing that makes it a little difficult to speak about Ali radiallahu anhu, because when you speak about Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, you see that Abu Bakr was the Khalifa for two years, and they were two years where there were يعني, virtually no problems and no fighting and no killing. Umar radiallahu anhu was the Khalifa for 10 years. Uthman radiallahu anhu was the Khalifa for 12 years. But 10 of these years, there were no problems. And all the, the fitan and problems only happened in the last two years. But when Ali radiallahu anhu became the Khalifa, the minute he became the Khalifa, there were problems already. So if you ever talk about the Khilafah of Ali radiallahu anhu, it's going to be from the beginning full of problems until the end. So, but inshallah, we don't want to get into that for our purposes. We want to get an idea of who Ali radiallahu anhu was and discuss the aspect of, uh, of his Khilafah of 
him becoming the Khalifa? Did he have the right to be the first Khalifa? Was he expecting to be the first Khalifa? Because this is an issue that you find it everywhere. Even if you Google Ali radiallahu anhu, immediately you'll find things about how he should have been the first Khalifa. And this verse in the Quran is indicating that he should have been the first Khalifa. All kinds of things. That's why I wanted to mention it. Uh, the, the scholar Masruq, one of the tabi'een, rahimahullah, he used to say that the knowledge of the Prophet sallallahu went to three. He's meaning this means these three people got the most of the knowledge of the Prophet sallallahu He says Umar radiallahu an and Ali and Abdullah. When you say Abdullah, it means Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an. One of the great things, of course, that Ali radiallahu anhu is known for, and one thing that was a great honor for him was his marriage to Fatima, the daughter of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, whereby which he comes become uh, he becomes the son-in-law of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And he married her after the Battle of Badr. And Fatima radiallahu anha, we all know her position amongst the women of the world and amongst uh, and with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And she also uh, resembled the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and she spoke like the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Aisha radiallahu anha says that I never saw anyone whose speech more closely resembled that of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam than Fatima. And whenever she entered, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would stand up to greet her. This is the Prophet of Allah, standing up to greet her, and then he would kiss her and welcome her, and she would do the same thing for him. So Ali radiallahu anhu marries Fatima radiallahu anha, and of course they have their famous uh, children, Al-Hasan and Al-Hussein. Now, did they have any daughters? Did they have any daughters? What do you think? Yes? Okay. A few people really hear of them very much. Uh, what were their names? Anyone? Excellent. Zainab and Umm Kulthum. Very good. Zakum uh, khayran. So her daughters were Umm Kulthum and Umm Kulthum later on is wed to Umar radiallahu anhu during his Khilafah. And Umar was a lot older than her, but he wanted another uh, tie to the Prophet sallallahu So she was married to Umar. We're going to come back to this point later on, inshallah. And Zainab, who was married to Abdullah, the son of Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, you see. And it's also interesting to note that the names of her daughters were similar to the names of her sisters, right? Excellent. طيب. And uh, among the virtues of Fatima radiallahu anha, the Prophet ﷺ said that Fatima is a part of me and whoever angers her angers me. The hadith in Bukhari and in Muslim. Al Hassan, specifically the oldest of the sons of, the, of Ali radiallahu anhu, he used to resemble the Prophet ﷺ very much. He looked like the Prophet ﷺ very much. And when people would see him, they would remember the Prophet. ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ would say, Allahumma inni uhibbuhu fa Oh Allah, I love him, so love him and love those who love him. And it's part of our religion, of course, to love the family of the Prophet. ﷺ. And Al Hassan was born in the middle uh, of Ramadan, in the third year after the Hijrah, and the Prophet ﷺ himself named him. One time, uh, the Prophet ﷺ was carrying Al Hassan on his shoulders. And a man saw this, so he says to Al Hassan, even though he was a young boy, he says to him, "Ni'm al Markib rakibt ya ghulam." He said, "What, what a good ride you have, young boy!" And you're riding on the shoulder of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And the Prophet responded, "Wa ni'm al Rakib hu," and what an excellent rider he is. So it's not just a good ride, but it's, so he's an excellent rider. Now, so this is Al Hassan, and we said there's Al Hussein, and there's also one, someone else, but not from Fatima, Muhammad. Ibn al Hanafiya. Now, so this son of Ali radiallahu anhu, his name was Muhammad, and he is of the scholars of the Muslims, and he has his interesting stories in his own biography. But he's referred to as Ibn al Hanafiya specifically to set him apart from the children of Fatima radiallahu anha, because they are the grandchildren of the Prophet. Ibn al Hanafiya from another woman, but not through, not linked to the Prophet through that, um, through that lineage. And we're going to come back to him again, inshallah. So we said that Ali radiallahu anhu became the Khalifa in very troubled times. And there are a lot of battles that took place. And Ali radiallahu anhu, he did the best that he could to unite the Muslims. He tried as much as possible for four years and nine months to unite the Muslims together. Uh, but we're not obviously going to cover all the battles and all the events that happened. And it's not really the place 
for the believers today, the believing men and women today, to try to comment and to try to say this side was right, this side was wrong. Because of course, obviously, in hindsight, everyone is going to say, well, you know, it was clear this was a mistake, it was clear that was a mistake. But at the time, it wasn't very clear. So now people, you find it's, it's amazing how they are able to speak about this issue as if they knew better than the Sahaba of the Prophet ﷺ. And you'll find people will speak and they begin to take sides and they'll begin to use terms that are not appropriate because we, they forget we're talking about the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. And it's interesting that the Prophet ﷺ indicates that both group had some truth. Yani when you talk about companions, if two companions disagree, it doesn't mean that the other group will be upon misguidance. Because the Prophet ﷺ, when he described the Khawarij, this group that left the army of Ali, the Prophet ﷺ described that they will be killed by the closer of the two groups to the truth. What does that mean? It's very interesting, this hadith. The closer of the two, two groups to the truth means both groups were upon the truth. But this group was closer to the truth. Because we're talking about companions. And with companions, they're both upon truth. Now, it's not like one will be upon the truth, the other will be a, a, absolutely upon falsehood. So we need to pay, that, pay attention to that and bear that in mind and have a lot of respect and not even delve into this issue. I and mean, You're not going to solve anything now when you discover well, what happened and why did he make this decision. You're not going to really solve anything. But the reason that sometimes you are compelled or we're compelled to discuss these issues is that there's so many people who have so many false narrations about these, this specific time period in history and they keep talking about and, and spreading the false. So then the people of, of Ahlul Sunnah, they want to know the truth and this is some of the times when it becomes necessary for people to understand what happened but they approach it delicately and they do not يعني, make a career out of... Uh, you know, faulting any of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, uh, so with that then we want to discuss the Khilafah because like I said, any time you now you hear anything about Ali radiallahu anhu, you hear all kinds of things about how he should have been the Khalifa. Some people even went overboard to say he should have been the Prophet instead of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So many people said so many crazy things about him. And even in his lifetime, they started to say crazy things about him. And he would try to quell that and it wouldn't succeed. But we want to talk about the, the Khilafah because so, some people argue that he should have been the first one to be the Khalifa. But we're really, when you examine text, you don't find any such indication. And you don't find any problem with the believers as to who should have been the successor of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It was very clear to everyone who it was. We see that in one narration, and now we'll start with narrations that show that hint towards who should be the Khalifa. In one narration, a woman came to the Prophet ﷺ, and he told her to come back at a later date. So she said to the Prophet ﷺ, what if I come back and I cannot find you? What is she trying to say? And what if you have passed away when I come back after a year or a couple of months? And the Prophet ﷺ tells her that if you do not find me, then go to Abu Bakr. So this was a, an indication now that after the death of the Prophet ﷺ, who do you go to next? You go to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Also is narrated by Ibn Mas'ud in a Sahih hadith narrated by Tirmidhi that the Prophet ﷺ said, take as your leaders iqtadu billadhaini min ba'di Abu Bakr wa Umar. Take leaders, those who come after me, Abu Bakr and Umar. And always you will hear Abu Bakr and Umar, Abu Bakr and Umar. So there was no doubt in the minds of the believers who were the leaders and who were the best. And during the illness of the Prophet ﷺ, he said to Aisha, uh, he call Abu Bakr for me and your, fa يعني, your father and your brother so that I may dictate a letter. I'm going to dictate a letter to them. For I am worried that someone who is ambitious might say that he's more entitled to the position of leadership than Abu Bakr. But Allah and the believers will not accept anyone other than Abu Bakr. This hadith narrated by Muslim. Very clear. And you don't find all the, the stories and drama and controversy that you find elsewhere. It's very, very clear. Uh, also, it was unanimously agreed that Abu Bakr was the best of them. And they used to say during the lifetime of the Prophet wasallam that the best of this ummah after its Prophet is Abu Bakr, then Umar, then Uthman. And the Prophet ﷺ would approve of that. And they would say it in front of him. And perhaps you heard these narrations a number of times, perhaps in the lectures before. 
And there are many reports from Ali radiallahu on himself. He would say that the best of this ummah after its prophet is Abu Bakr and then Umar. And then he would say, no one is brought to me who prefers me over them, but I will whip him with the had punishment for li- telling lies. It is said in his Khilafah, one time he was يعني, in the place of obviously uh, in the, the place of the Khalifa, which is like the position of a judge as well. You can assist and help people. So a man comes to him and he says, O oh best of people, Ya Khair al Nas, O oh best of people, look, look into my affair, for I have never seen anyone better than you. This is really strong praise. But Ali radiallahu anhu gets upset. He says, Wayhak, Aina Abu Bakr wa Umar. He says, What about Abu Bakr and Umar? So the man says, actually, I never saw them. And the man hadn't seen Abu Bakr nor Umar. He said, I actually never saw them. So Ali radiallahu anhu said, if you would have told me that you would have seen them, لَأَوْجَعْتُكَ darban. I would have hit you into the, until you would be in pain. This is Ali radiallahu anhu not accepting to be in a position higher than Abu Bakr and Umar, which everyone used to say in front of the Prophet they are the best, and the Prophet would remain quiet. So why would he accept someone to put him or to raise him in rank over Abu Bakr and over Umar radiallahu anhuma? It was also, now remember we said his son Muhammad ibn Hanafiya. It was narrated from his son Muhammad ibn Hanafiya. He said, I said to my father, meaning Ali ibn Abi Talib, which of the people is the best after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Now he wants to know, this is a young man, wants to know from his father who's the best after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So now Ali radiallahu anhu tells him Abu Bakr. He says, I asked, then whom? He said, Umar. And then he says, this is now Muhammad ibn Hanafiya, his son. He said, I was worried that he's going to say Uthman. Why? Why was he worried that he was going to say Uthman specifically? Because he knew Uthman was number three. He knew it. That's why he was worried that he was going to say Uthman. He didn't say, I was worried he was going to say Hudayf ibn al-Yaman or anyone else. He knew it was Uthman coming. So he, was, he wanted his father to say himself. So he says, so I asked him, then you, this is now a son to his father, then you, and Ali radiallahu anhu, out of his humility, he said, I am just a man from among the Muslims. But we know the position of Ali radiallahu anhu. But out of his humility, of course, that's what he would say. And this is narrated in Sahih al-Bukhari. Then, it's interesting that Ali radiallahu anhu actually pledged to Abu Bakr when Abu Bakr became the Khalifa. Because now people claim that Ali should have been the Khalifa. And no one should have been the Khalifa instead of him. And when Abu Bakr became the Khalifa, Ali radiallahu anhu was very angry. And he refused to pledge to him. But that's not the case. He actually pledged to Abu Bakr, the scholars say. And then they say after the death of, of Aisha, six month, uh, Fatima Afwan, six months later, he goes and he does it again. Just to quell any rumors that he is not pleased with Abu Bakr's Khilafa. He does it again publicly as well. And... Sometimes you'll read uh, in books of history, and I'll explain to you why you'll see this, that when they went to pledge to Abu Bakr, because now all the evidences were saying everybody knew Abu Bakr was the best. So why was there a fight after the death of the Prophet ﷺ as to who should be the Khalifa? There shouldn't be a fight. Everyone knows it's Abu Bakr, right? Realistically, there wasn't a big fight. There wasn't a big fight. Uh, the, the, the narration of the big fight is actually uh, one of the weak narrations in the history book of At-Tabari. And the thing is that Imam At-Tabari, he, his intent wasn't to gather all authentic narrations. And if you read the introduction, he says that clearly. He says his intent was to gather everything, the authentic and the weak. But he lets you know that it's weak. How? By mentioning the chain of narrations. So obviously you need to be a scholar who understands who is weak and who is not. And you read it, and if you see that name in the chain of narration, you know, okay, this is a weak narration. So he doesn't say this is weak, this is strong. So most people think, oh, Tariq al-Tabari, and he's a great scholar, so it must be authentic. But that's not the case. And so sometimes you'll, f- you'll find it just copied out of that book, where the narration where there's a big fight, and people say, who's going to be the Khalifa, and so on. But realistically, as some scholars say, the issue just took a few moments, because nobody yani, would, would dare lead over Abu Bakr. And they knew he was the best after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Interestingly, Ali radiallahu anhu was a judge during the reign of Umar radiallahu anhu. Because now the people are claiming that, that Abu Bakr stole the Khilafah from Ali radiallahu anhu. This is now of course, not, it's not a Sunni uh, claim. يعني. So they said he took the Khilafah from, Umar, uh, from Ali, Ali was upset. And then Umar came, and so then you would expect Ali radiallahu anhu would be more upset, right? If you're standing in line, and then one person comes in front of you, 
You get really upset. It's my turn. And then that person moves. Another guy comes in front of you. You get more upset now. So you are going to voice your concern. We don't have anything where Ali radiallahu anhu was complaining. Ali took, that Abu Bakr took the khilafah from us. Or Umar took the khilafah from us. We don't have anything like that. Not only that, he starts, he works. He gets the position of judge, which is a big position in the government of, uh, or during the khilafah of Umar radiallahu anhu. And Umar radiallahu anhu used to appreciate the position of Ali. And he used to seek refuge from, uh, from Allah from a problem when Ali is not there. This is how much he trusted the judgment of Ali radiallahu anhu. So Ali was cooperating in a part of the khilafah of Umar radiallahu anhu. It's also interesting that uh, not only did Ali never ever mention that he was entitled to the khilafah, but he also, like we said, mentioned his daughter Umm Kulthum. He married his daughter Umm Kulthum to Umar radiallahu anhu. So wh- why would he do that? And some people, of course... And went overboard and they, they made all kinds of claims that they were extreme enemies. Like why would you give your daughter in marriage to someone that was your extreme enemy? But this was the case. So like I said, when you look, you look at the evidences and you look at the narrations, you don't find any such problem that, there, that this existed. And this only, as you well know, came about years later, years after the death of the Prophet ﷺ, these problems started to arise about who should have been the Khalifa, even though they, this wasn't an issue during the time of the process of, of Abu Bakr, nor Umar, nor the time of Uthman. No one said it should have been with Ali or any, nor did Ali radiallahu anhu say the same thing. And when Umar radiallahu anhu was stabbed, now they have to choose the third Khalifa. And again, if Ali felt he was cheated the first and second time, then he would want to be the Khalifa the third time. Because it's his right, if, if according to what the argument is, because he's from the family of the Prophet he should be. So then he would know this is his religious right, he would ask for it. But what happens after Umar radiallahu anhu was stabbed, he appointed the six, the six people of Shura or the six people that the Prophet ﷺ was pleased with and he had, uh, يعني, he had testified that he was pleased with them and he guaranteed them they were of those who were guaranteed paradise as well. And so he, uh, he lets them appoint one of them. So these six have to choose one of them as the successor or the Khalifa after Umar. So what happens is Abdurrahman ibn Awf radiallahu anhu he withdraws. He says, I don't want to be the Khalifa. And he asked Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, would you want to withdraw as well? So Sa'ad says, yes. So now we have two people who withdrew and we have four people left. So then he asked the rest, do you mind if I, يعني, if I take care of this and, and, and help you decide the Khalifa? They said, okay. So then he goes to Uthman radiallahu anhu alone. And he says, who do you vote for? Who do you want to be the Khalifa? And Uthman radiallahu anhu says, Ali. Then he goes to Ali radiallahu anhu who do you want to be the Khalifa? And Ali says, Uthman. He didn't say, it's me. This is my right. This is what the Prophet promised me. This is what is promised to me in the Quran. Because if it was promised to him, he would say, this is what Allah promised me. But there's no such thing. All of this just nonsense that comes years later on. Just gibberish. So Ali radiallahu anhu wants Uthman to be the Khalifa. Then as Zubair ibn al-Awam was asked, who should be the Khalifa? He says, he says, Ali or Uthman? To him, it's one of these two. Because the, there were four يعني, in the list, right? Or there are other three that he could choose from. What does that mean? Because two don't want to be. And then he can't, obviously, he's in it himself. But there are other three that he can choose from. He says, no, I want it to be either Ali or Uthman. And then he goes to Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas. And he says, okay, who do you want to be the Khalifa? And Sa'ad says, Uthman. And then after that, he goes to, and Talha radiallahu anhu, by the way, he's the sixth person, but he was away during the time Umar was stabbed. Then after that, he goes to the people of, in, in Medina. He spent days, and he would go and ask people if they approve of Uthman and so on and so forth, and everybody approved. So that was how it was done. And this is, part, this is how people knew it. They knew it was Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and then came Ali radiallahu anhu. And interestingly also, after Ali radiallahu anhu finally becomes the Khalifa, he never says, ah, this is my rightful place, and the people before me cheated me, and this is, I mean, he's not the Khalifa, he can say what he wants. Never, you don't ever see this. So more and more you look at it, you see that this is just some, some creation that came many years later, and did not exist at that time. And if it existed at that time, there'd be a lot of evidence to indicate that. Interestingly also, uh, Ja'far al-Sadiq. Ja'far al-Sadiq, one of the, one of the great uh, scholars of Islam, 
and he was like a contemporary of Imam Abu Hanifa, uh, rahimahullah, and the. Uh, yeah, well, the, he was born in the year 90 after the Hijrah, like Imam Abu Hanifa. But he, and so the exact same age, but he, he dies before Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah. Jafar al-Sadiq, and he is actually the son of Muhammad al-Baqir, who is the son of Ali, the son of al Hussein, the son of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Okay, so Ali ibn Abi Talib had a son, al-Hassan al-Hussein. Hussein had a son, he named him Ali, like his father. And then Ali had a son named him Muhammad. And Muhammad had a son named him Ja'far. That is Ja'far al-Sadiq. The great, great scholar of Islam, Ja'far al-Sadiq. Ja'far al-Sadiq used to say about Abu Bakr and Umar, Huma wazira jaddi. They are the, like the ministers of my grandfather, the Prophet Wasallam. They're his right-hand men, they're his ministers, and they're his supporters. And they asked him, what, do you, what is their position from the Prophet Wasallam?" Because later on you understand these were all issues, always people doubting this person and that person. So they were telling him, what, what is their position from the Prophet ﷺ? And he said, it's the same position they're in now. What does that mean? The three of them buried together, they're all close. He said, it's the same position that they're in now. That they were all close to uh, the Prophet ﷺ. And it's interesting that he also used to say that Abu Bakr anhu gave birth to me twice. Who is this? This is Ja'far al-Sadiq. The son of Muhammad, the son of Ali, the son of Al-Hussein, the son of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He used to say, Abu Bakr gave birth to me twice. And actually when you trace his lineage, through, uh, his, through both ways, he has a link to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Through his father and through his mother. No, to Abu Bakr, sorry. Through his father and through his mother, he, he's linked to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And so that really confounds it and makes it so difficult for people who claim that... Uh, <laughs> And he would claim all these problems existed and all the hatred existed and yet they're all related and they have positive things to say about each other. I see people are getting sleepy. So we're now going to go to the assassination of Ali radiallahu anhu. And how it all began is that there were three of the Khawarij who were sitting down. The Khawarij are those people who left the army of Aisha, uh, Afwan, the army of Ali radiallahu anhu. And they basically would make takfir on the Muslims, and, and the Prophet had warned of them a long time ago. So the three khawarij that were sitting down and discussing the affairs of the Ummah, one of them said, all of the problems we have today are because of Muawiyah. The other said, all of the problems we have today are because of Ali. And, one, and the third one said, Amr ibn al-As is not far from those two either. So they decided right then and there, to kill and to get rid of these three. He said, we'll, they said, we will rid the people of these three. And so they agreed to kill all three of them at the same time. Of course, all three were in different areas. But they agreed that after Fajr prayer on the 17th of Ramadan, they would kill them. So all of them left to these different cities. Uh, they can't obviously keep in contact now. But they just agreed on the Friday, the 17th of Ramadan, we were going to, after Fajr prayer, we we're going to kill them all at the same time. So, the man, uh, a man by the name of Al-Burq, this is one of them, Al-Burq ibn Abdullah al-Tamimi, he goes to Asham to kill Muawiyah. And he prays Fajr behind him. And as Muawiyah left the masjid after the Salah, he lifted his sword to strike Muawiyah radiallahu anh. Muawiyah noticed that. He caught the sword going up and he jumped out of the way. So he got cut, but it didn't, يعني, it didn't kill him. But the sword was poisoned. And so they brought him a doctor. And the doctor tells him that I have two remedies for you. One of them is cauterization, which is by fire, burning the flesh with fire. And the other is a medicine. If I give it to you, you will become sterile. You'll never have children after that. He said, as for the fire, I have no patience for fire. Give me the medicine. And he took it and subhanAllah said that he never ever had children after that. Then the other man, the man goes to Amr ibn al-As, the, the second man, goes to kill Amr ibn al-As. And he, he prays in the masjid in Fajr behind Amr ibn As. And after the salah, he jumped and started to stab him. And he killed him and said, Allahu Akbar. And then he discovers that Amr ibn As, Qaddar Allah, he was sick that day. And he sent Kharija ibn Hudafa as Sahmi in his place. So he actually killed the wrong man. The man who went to Ali radiallahu anhu, his name was Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim. And this man, he came to Al-Kufa, where Ali radiallahu anhu was. And he found Ali radiallahu anhu coming into the masjid, calling the people for salah. Ayyuha nas as-salah, 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 as-salah. And so, 
so Ab- Ibn Muljim then this is before the Salah Ibn Muljim takes his his weapon and he attacks Ali saying al hukm lillah la lak ya Ali wala li ashabik he says the judgment is to Allah not to you O Ali nor to your companions and he struck with the sword he struck Ali radiyallahu anhu in his forehead and it was a very hard hit and it was a huge wound and the sword was poisoned as well and imagine this now this great companion and this man thinks that this is a good thing he's doing because they were khawarij this is how they operated so now no one is to 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 blame us for the 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 death of ali radiallahu anhu just like they try to blame us for the death of al-hussein part of our deen is to love them part of our deen is to love the companions and the family of the prophet so we don't accept any blame here this man is from the khawarij attacks this great companion this great Khalifa Ali radiallahu anh, he strikes, strikes him in his forehead with a poison sword, but Ali radiallahu anh doesn't die immediately. He stays alive for three days. But when he's struck, he says, لا يفوتنكم الرجل that Don't let him get away. So they caught the man. And so then he commands uh, Ju'd ibn Hubayra to lead the salah, lead the people in prayer. And he tells his sons and he tells the people, a soul for a soul. If I die, kill him as he killed me. And then he starts to give advice to his children. This is before passing away. So he tells them, O oh, sons of Abdul Muttalib, do not shed blood, saying Amir al Mu'mineen has been killed. Verily, none should be killed except my killer. And he's telling, because why is he saying this? And he, he learned from the experience of Uthman. Uthman was killed, and then so many other battles went because we're trying to avenge the death of Uthman. So he's saying, if I get killed, don't start saying Amir al Mu'mineen was killed. Just a soul for soul. Don't kill anybody else. Just the one who kills me. And then he tells Al-Hasan, he tells Undur Ya Hasan. He says, listen Ya Hasan, if I die, whoever struck me this blow, then it's a blow for a blow. And don't make tamthil on the man. Yani do not disfigure the dead body. For I heard the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say, Iyakum wal muthla. Do not ever come near tamthil, which is to disfigure the dead. Walaw bil kalb al Even if it's a dead dog, you don't disfigure the body. And this is something the Arabs used to do after battle as an insult to injury. They would come and start to disfigure, cut off the noses and ears and things of the, the dead. More, uh, more of an insult. The Prophet ﷺ forbade that. The Muslim army never did that. So then uh, a man by the name of Jundub ibn Abdullah, he enters and he says, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, if we lose you, and I hope we don't, should we pledge to Al-Hasan? And Ali radiallahu anhu says, I do not order you, nor do I prevent you? Antum absar. And you know better. I'm not going to command you to do it. I'm not going to say, don't do it. You, you will make your own decision. So then he calls Al-Hasan and Al-Hussein. And he starts to give them very, very beautiful advice. These are now his parting words. So he tells them, I advise you with the taqwa of Allah. And do not desire the dunya. So let's see if this, yani, if this advice now we can, we can apply it to ourselves. I advise you with the taqwa of Allah. And do not desire the dunya, even if it calls you to it. And do not cry over something that gets away from you and speak the truth. And have mercy on the orphan. And you're thinking, okay, now he's passing away. It's not just, you know, give this money to so-and-so and your mother. And the, it's, look at things that he's mentioning. He's mentioning good akhlaq. He's mentioning taking care of the orphan. And he says, assist the lost. And even a lost person, now he's giving, he's remembering a lost person in the time of his passing away. And work for the next life. And be the opponent of the oppressor and the supporter of the oppressed, and act on what is on the, in the book of Allah, and do not fear those who will blame you for doing what is right. And we live in the day and age of people blaming you for doing what is right. Then he turns to his other son, Muhammad ibn Hanafiya, and he tells him, have you learned what I advise your brothers with? He says, yes. It means, and it means it, it applies to you as well. And then he tells him, I advise you with the same, and I advise you to have respect for your brothers, because of the great rights that they have upon you. What does that mean? It means they are the grandchildren of the Prophet ﷺ. So we have to have respect for that. And do not undertake any affair without them. Then he turns to Al-Hasan and Al-Husayn. He says, I advise you to take care of him. For he is your brother and the son of your father. And you know that your father used to love him. Then he tells Al-Hasan, he tells him, O oh son, I advise you with the taqwa of Allah and establishing salah. Always you hear salah. Very important. In, in establishing salah in its time and paying the zakah in its place, and perfecting the wudu. And you imagine, what does wudu have to do with it? Just 
do, do this alone time. But even the wudu, and wudu is an act of worship, and you perfect it. It's not just about getting wet. So he's saying, perfect the wudu, for there is no salah except with tahara. And I advise you to forgive others and to control your temper. And the ties of the wombs and clemency with the ignorant and understanding of the religion and being conclusive in affairs, meaning don't rush to make decisions and being close to the Qur'an and being good to your neighbor and commanding that which is good and forbidding that which is evil and abstaining from the haram and he keeps on advising them and advising them until he passed away radiallahu anhu. After his death he was washed by Al-Hasan, his sons Al-Hasan and Al-Hussein and Abdullah, the son of Ja'far, the son of Abu Talib, so the brother of Ali, the son of his brother, يعني. and uh, Al-Hasan led the prayers and Ali had remained alive all of Friday, all of Saturday and all of Sunday except he dies Sunday night and he's buried in the city of Al-Kufa and he died at the age of 63. His reign was for four years and nine months and he actually, يعني, his reign was at a very, very difficult time. There were so many people who kept disobeying him. So, d- disobeying him. So many times he had the right opinion. And he would say, we need to do this. And the people would disobey him. And the problem is that there were people, يعني, troublemakers and people of fitna, embedded into his army. And they sometimes would f- purposely do the opposite of what he says. Sometimes they would, uh, on, يعني, right in front of him, disagree with what he tells them to do. And he tells them, don't fight, they go and fight. He says, fight, they don't go. يعني, very, very difficult. And people now today, they try to look back and, and imagine they were geniuses and this is what he should have done. No, you have people who won't obey you, people who are making problems and causing issues. So it was a very, very difficult reign. And uh, a man one time came to Ali radiallahu anhu. He says, and he's, this man is trying to be a wise guy. يعني. He's saying, why is it that at the time of Abu Bakr and Umar, there were no problems? And at your time, it's so full of problems. So Ali radiallahu anhu tells him, because at the time of Abu Bakr and Umar, they ruled over people like me. And in my time, I rule over people like you. (laughs) So we'll conclude there. It is part of a religion to love Ali radiallahu anhu and Fatima and Al-Hasan and Al-Husayn, as well as the mothers of the believers and Bani Hashim and Bani Abdul Muttalib. As the scholars say, they're all part of the family of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And some people try to hijack the love of the family of the Prophet ﷺ. But it is part of our deen and we love them because the Prophet ﷺ also told us to love them. Zakumullahu khairan ala husn istima'akum. Sallallahu wa barak ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa